really, really spoke in me uh, quite significantly. So I've, I've been excited for it today. I, I was sitting before the Lord in particular this morning and uh, he was speaking this in me maybe yesterday, day before, but this morning I was just sitting and really hearing the Lord and when you when you hear the Lord speak in you, it just changes perception. In fact, it can change perception immediately. And many times I, I'm just so amazed because I may have looked at something for years and years and all at once I just see it. And so we've... We've talked a lot about the work of God in Christ and I actually titled this Living Out of the Abundance of His Supply. So, so what we're going to talk about is living out of His supply, what God has supplied. And we're going to start in Genesis chapter 2. And we're going to move through some, uh, some scriptures in Genesis and Joshua and Deuteronomy in several places tonight. But in, in Genesis 2, uh, this, is, this has caught my heart for a long time, that God made the man. Verse 1 said, Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. And on the seventh day God ended his work, which he had made, and he rested on the seventh day from all the, his work, which he had made. And God blessed the seventh day and hallowed it, because that in it he rested from all his work, which God had created and made. These are the generations of the heavens and the earth when they were created in the day that Jehovah God made earth and heaven. And no plant of the field was yet in them, and no herb of the field had yet sprung up, for Jehovah God had not caused it to rain upon the earth, and there was not a man to till the ground. But there went up a mist from the earth and watered the whole face of the ground. <laughs> and Jehovah God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. And Jehovah God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground made Jehovah God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food, and, a tree of life, and the tree of life also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And a river went out of Eden to water the garden, and from thence it was parted and became four heads. The name of the first is Pishon, that which compasseth the whole land of Havilah, where there is gold, and the gold of that land is good. There's bedellium and onyx stone, and the name of the second is Gion, the same as that that compassed the whole land of Cush, and the name of the third is Hittical, which goes in front of Assyria, and the fourth is the Euphrates. And Jehovah God took the man and put him into the Garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. And Jehovah God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree you may eat freely, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day there eat of thereof, there shalt surely die. What I began to look at this, and I've considered this several times. God made the heavens and the earth, and he rested. And he put man in his rest. So when, when Adam was created and put into Eden, the earth supplied everything Adam needed. You know, as far as the natural man goes, the, the, the mist came up and watered the earth. The the water rolled through Eden and, and watered it, and the fruit trees bore the fruit and provided for Adam. So there was this provision that Adam lived in, and it was God's provision. That was the such a powerful picture that God painted here in Eden. And when you, when you look at an artist, 
the greatest artist of all is the Lord. The greatest poet of all is the Lord. When you look at all these things and, and what he says, so what he says through, through, through this creation story is he made, he created, and he placed in his plan. So he placed Adam in his plan, and Adam was provided for. So what God had, had done had provided for him. And, and I wrote a little post on Facebook and I, uh, this weekend, it, it wasn't as long as most of my posts, but it, I, I said in it, I, I said, I see grace is a much bigger picture than just God forgiving our sins and not counting them against us. This is, this is where people see grace. I see it as a people receiving the full work of God in Christ Jesus. Of his fullness we've received. And grace for grace. John 1, Ephesians 2, 5, even when we were dead in sins, he quickened us together with Christ. By grace are you saved and raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. As Israel, as Israel was to live out the work of God done, bringing them from Goshen into the land of promise, flowing with milk and honey, we, the body of Christ, are to live out of the work that God did in Christ in his death, burial, and resurrection. This is grace. The flow of God toward us from the finished work done at the cross of Jesus Christ. That's what grace is. You know, I've been trying to, to put grace in a definition for some time because you've got a grace movement up on the land. It's, you know, people are talking about grace and, and rightfully so. But the concept of grace is, is typically most, much smaller than what I just said. And it's not that I said it. It's what the Word of God declares. Of his fullness have we received and grace for grace. So, so the picture of grace is the supply of God. You, you, know, you know, there's a couple of definitions, and one definition of grace is, is the, the direction on the heart, that, that's toward the heart. And what that is, is what the divine influence upon the heart and the reflection that it creates, well, what that is, is the flow of God toward you that's in Christ Jesus. And, and another one's the unmerited favor. And again, that's the same thing. That's the flow of God toward you that's in Christ Jesus. I can, I can say the divine uh, influence on the heart, but if I don't find that in the person of Jesus Christ, I don't even know what the divine influence is. If I don't find the unmerited favor of God in the person of Jesus Christ, I don't know what the favor of God is. I'm I, 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 well, God isn't mad at me, people say. Okay. It's a bigger understanding that we've come into, or it should be. And this is what the Lord is dealing with me out of, is living out of the abundance of his supply, just like he did with Adam. Adam was to live out of the abundance of what God had given him. And he, and he did the same thing with the children of Israel. So God took Israel out of Egypt. He, he, Israel never just escaped Egypt. Israel didn't just wake up one day and say, hey, let's go over to Canaan. You know, I'm tired of this Egypt thing, so we're going to head over to Canaan land. That wasn't what happened. Israel was taken from the, by the Lord from Egypt. And the work of God brought them out 
and the work of God provided was provision for them. They were living, and they weren't comprehending it, but they were living out of the work that God had done. And, and they even sung that song in, in recorded in Exodus 15, how that the Lord, by his mighty hand, had brought them out. So they sing a song, but they don't comprehend what they're singing. Sing the song, the mighty hand of the Lord has delivered us. But then there's not a comprehension of the deliverance. So, so these people that have been delivered of God never enter in, you know, the, that first generation doesn't enter into the promised land, but Joshua and Caleb, and the ones younger than 20, so in Joshua 1, the Bible reads in verse 1, after the death of Moses, Joshua 1, verse 1, after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spake unto Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses, Moses minister, saying, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now, therefore... Arise, go over this Jordan, thou and all this people, unto the land which I do give. Listen to that. Which I do give to them. You're talking about grace. The picture of grace in the Old Testament. A lot of people say it's hard to find grace in the Old Testament. <laughs> when God opens your eyes, you see the deliverance of, of Egypt. From Egypt, you see the crossing of the Red Sea and you see before them the land that I do give them. That's grace. Even to the children of Israel, every place that the sole of your feet shall tread upon, that have I given you, as I said unto Moses, from the wilderness of this Lebanon, even unto this great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites, and unto the great sea toward the going down of the sun shall be your coast. There shall not any man be able to stand before thee all the days of thy life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with thee. I will not fail thee, nor forsake thee. Be strong and of good courage, for unto this people shalt thou divide for an inheritance the land. Mark that word, inheritance. Which I swear, God swore it. And in Hebrews, it speaks in one place where he swore by himself, because he could swear by no greater, he swore by himself. And I saw that picture of that when he cut the covenant with Abraham. A long time ago, I was looking at that and when God cut the covenant with Abraham, he went in to the sacrifice and he come out and he did it himself. And I just hear this inside. I, even I am the Lord and beside me there is no savior. God's saying, I'm cutting it myself. I, I'm going to do it myself. <laughs> There's nothing no savior beside me. I'm the Lord. I'm doing this thing. I'm cutting the covenant myself. And that's what he's saying to them. I'm giving you the land. And he goes on, verse 7, says, only be strong and very courageous that thou mayest observe to, to do according to all the law. And I even want you to mark that tonight. That you might observe to do according to the law which Moses my servant commanded thee, turn not from it to the right hand or to the left hand, that thou mayest prosper wherever thou goest. Deuteronomy 11. And if, we won't read all the chapter for time's sake, but Deuteronomy 11, and we're going to start at verse 18, but here God is telling them if they behold the word of God, and keep it before them, he's going to, he's going to. Always get this. 
He's going to provide. He's going to increase. He's going to bless. It's always God doing abundantly above. And he said, therefore, shall you lay up these my words in your heart and in your soul and bind them for a sign upon your hand that they may be as frontlets between your eyes. And you shall teach them to your children, speaking of them when thou sittest in thine house and when thou walkest by the way, when thou liest down and when thou risest up. Man, that's all the time. You, you teach the, these words to your children when you sit in your house, when you walk along the way, when you lie down and when you rise up. And thou shalt write them on the doorposts of thine house and upon thy gates, that your days may be multiplied. You can, you can maybe say increased. And the days of your children in the land which the Lord swear unto your fathers to give them as the days of heaven upon earth. For if you shall diligently keep all these commandments which I command you to do them, to love the Lord your God, to walk in all his ways and to cleave unto them, then will the Lord drive out all these nations from before you, and you shall possess greater nations and mightier than yourself. Every place whereon the soles of your feet shall tread shall be yours. From the wilderness in the Lebanon, from the river, the river Euphrates, even unto the uttermost sea shall your coast be. There shall no man be able to stand before you, for the Lord your God shall lay the fear of you and the dread of you upon all the land that you shall tread upon, as he hath said unto you. As he hath said. See, see this is all about what he said. What about he's done? And it's flowing out of him. See, see the picture here it, back in Adam was Adam in the garden was living out of the flow of God. Adam hadn't made the trees grow, grow. Adam hadn't planted them. Adam hadn't watered it. Adam hadn't done anything but he was stuck in that garden to tend it and to keep it and had and you know that was a picture and here's another picture this is a picture of the promise the promised land is a picture of being in christ we talk about being in christ and this is what just rose up in my heart this morning we we say we're in christ and that's true that's the promised land, folks. What is in Christ is your inheritance. Everything that is in him is for you to live in, to walk in, to abide in, to dwell in. That's the promised land. That's what your heart and mind is looking for Ephesians 2 says it now in Christ Jesus you who were far off are made nigh by the blood of the lamb now in Christ Jesus so what's in Christ Jesus is your inheritance that's it so Flip over to Colossians chapter 2. Colossians 2. I love this scripture and I've been in it for a long time. And it just spoke even more in me today. Verse 6. As you have received Christ Jesus the Lord. Now, go back and think of Israel for a moment. Or even Adam. Adam, as you've received this garden, walk in it. Israel, as you've received the promised land, everywhere your foot goes, you're going to possess it. You're going to dwell in it. 
as you've received Christ Jesus the Lord, walk in Him. Here you go. Here's the place we walk. Rooted and built up in Him. So we're rooted just like they were rooted, like God told Israel, I'm going to take you into the land. I'm going to plant you into the place of mine inheritance. Here, you're rooted, you're planted, you're put in to the land, built up in him to be established in the faith, even as you were taught. Remember, we read that teaching in Deuteronomy, teaching our children day and night of the word of God. So we're established in the faith and we're taught abounding herein in thanksgiving. And Paul comes along and says, Take heed, lest there be any one that makes spoil of you through his philosophy and vain deceit. After the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. For in him dwells, dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And in him you are made full, or you are complete in him, who is the head of all principality and power in whom you were circumcised with a circumcision not made with hands and the putting off of the body of, of the flesh in the circumcision of Christ. So he brings you to what's in the land here. You're circumcised. You know, you go back and you look at the picture of the Israelites entering into the promised land. What had to happen to those, to that young generation that entered in there? They come to Gilgal, and they had to be circumcised. So, he, so that's a picture of being in Christ Jesus. So you've received your inheritance, which is Christ Jesus the Lord, to walk in him. And as you begin to walk in him, you're circumcised with a circumcision not made with hands, putting off the body of the flesh in the circumcision of Christ. Having been buried with him in baptism, wherein you're raised with him through the faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. And you being dead through your trespasses and uncircumcision of your flesh, you, I say, did he make a life together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. See, see, this is what's in the land. See, when, when I walk according to what's in the land, this is what's in it, that, <laughs> that we have been circumcised, the uncircumcision of our flesh, the carnality, the understanding of the natural man, the sins of the flesh that were against us, They've been removed. They've been cut away. <laughs> and we've been made alive together with Christ. Glory to God. Having blotted out the bond written in ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and he's taken it out of the way, nailing it to his cross, having despoiled the principalities and powers he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. Now, when Paul writes all this, look at what he says in verse 16. But therefore, because of this, let no man judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of a feast day or a new moon or a Sabbath day. Because of the work of God in Christ, don't allow, see, here's the, here's the rudiments, here's the philosophies of man, here's the things that will take you away from the truth that's in Christ. Don't let man judge you in meat and drink or in respect of a feast day or a new moon because your judgment is according to Christ. That's your judgment. 
And if it's not according to Christ, it's not true judgment. See, see, this is what's happened to believers. Like people are, are saying, how do I live? You know, I, I've been preached I'm dead. Well, well, being dead to sin is part of living unto Christ. That's part of the land you're in. See, in the land you're in, you're dead to sin. In the land you're in, you're buried in his burial, in, his, in being baptized into his death. You're buried in that because you've been made dead to the old world. But you've been made alive to watch him, and watch him is flowing out of us. It's the abundant life of God that is flowing toward us and out of us and through us in the earth because that's what God did in Christ. Out of your belly shall flow rivers of living water. The abundant life. As you understand the truth that's in Christ, this life's going to flow because it's what's in the land. So it's like the, the children of Israel enter into the land and they find this fruit bigger and better than any fruit they've seen because that was what was in the land. See, see, that's what's in this land, man. You're dead to sin in this land. You're dead to the works of Adam in this land. And you're alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord in this land. See, see, there's something powerful, and I've read it probably hundreds of times. Isaiah 42, 6, in fact, I read it Sunday. But it's... <laughs> But I've read it, and I may have never read it like I read it today. You ever done that? You've read it, but you read it different than you read it before. Isaiah 42, 6. I, Jehovah, have called thee in righteousness, and I will hold thy hand, and I will keep thee, and I will give thee for a covenant of the people. For the light, for light of the Gentiles. What's in Christ is the covenant of the people. What's outside of Christ is not the covenant. See, a lot, of, a lot of where our minds are tortured, if I can use that word. Is that that's outside of Christ? Well, that's not your covenant anyway. That's, that's again why Paul said, Beware lest any man spoil you through vain philosophy and vain deceit after the rudiments of the world and not after Christ because so, they're spoiling. Look, look what's going on today. What's, what's stopping people from entering into the rest of God that he prepared for us all through the ages, God prepared it, spoke it, and then it came to pass in the person of Jesus Christ when he gave his son at the cross, and he died, and he was buried, and he raised from the dead, and ascended back into glory. All this was prepared from the foundation of the world unto us that believe. And now everything that's in this is the land we live in, and, and if I'm not walking toward this, see, I'm walking toward tradition of man. See, see, a lot of God's people, that's where they're walking at, tradition of man. They've received Christ Jesus the Lord, but they're not walking in him. If they're like, like Israel, they wouldn't cross over. And sometimes there wasn't a priest standing in the water showing them the way into the land. Priest wasn't in the water. Priest wasn't speaking out a lie. 
You know, the water doesn't always represent death. Out of your belly shall flow rivers of living water. And so that water of life, you know, a priest standing in the water of life to show the way of the ark of the covenant of the Lord, because you got to be in life to see the way of the ark of the covenant of the Lord to enter into that that's in the ark. If you're not in life yourself, if you don't see that life, then you're not going to create that flow. Right? One last place here. Ephesians 1. I'm going to read out of the English Standard Version. Of Ephesians 1, 11 through 14. This kind of says it. In him we have obtained an inheritance. See, Israel obtained an inheritance in a land called Canaan, flowing with milk and honey. And I would say to you guys, this is a thought, I haven't searched it out, but it come before me today. Even the fact that, it, that God said milk and honey is speaking of the Lord. Because as newborn babes, we grow on the sincere milk of the word. And the honey came out of the, the battle there in the new land, didn't it? Didn't Samson slay the beast and in the beast and the, in the jaw of the beast? I don't have the story down just right, but wasn't it full of honey? So there in that land, so it's a land flowing with milk, sincere truth of the word and the meat of the word. We could possibly say there's just something working in me that I've got to look at. Just come before me today. But in him we've obtained an inheritance, having been predestinated according to the purpose of him, who works all things according to the counsel of his will, so that we who are the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. In him you also, when you heard the word of the truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance. Wait a second here. Where's their inheritance at? See, see, the story about this guarantee in a lot of Christian thinking is someday after a while, we're going to get our inheritance. But just think on this. In him, we have obtained an inheritance. The guarantee of this inheritance is the seal of the Holy Spirit, the inheritance that's in Christ. Now, let me go back and read, read this again. We're sealed with the promise of the Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our, our inheritance until we acquire possession of it. The inheritance that is in Christ till we acquire the possession of it. It's like Paul saying, I've been apprehended by Christ. Now I'm acquiring or comprehending or possessing that that I have been apprehended for. I'm receiving my inheritance, which is in Christ Jesus, which is to the praise of, of the glory of God to the full measure of him. That's our inheritance. That way we grow up in him in all things. That we would possess the land that we've been put into. Now in Christ Jesus, you who were far away from this land are made nigh, have come to it. 
to possess it. I can just hear that today. You're dead to sin, possess it. You're dead to the world, possess it. You're alive unto God in Christ Jesus the Lord, possess it. All the fullness of God dwelleth in him. You're complete in him. There's a land to possess. There's a reality to know. And that's what God has brought us into that we might acquire or know the fullness, the completion of God. The word fullness can be translated completion. God's complete work in Christ Jesus. That's what he wants us to know. His complete work that he's done in Christ. That from the ages and generations that he planned in his own heart. That was in him in the beginning. When John says in the beginning was the word. This is what was in him. Was this word of life. That was with the father from the beginning. It was in him in the beginning. And that was his mind from the beginning that he would have a people, a family of God flourishing in his word. Living it. Living in the abundance of the life that this word produces. And I, I just keep hearing this roll inside of me, uh, Brother Register, that, that the death of the cross is maybe part of the life because the death of the cross is in the land because that death of the cross X's out all that old stuff, all the penalties, all the judgments, all, all the negativity, everything that was against us at that death came to an end. And now in his resurrection, all the fullness of his life came forth. And always, like Paul said, we're always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord. Because the dying of the Lord cancels out all these things. Takes care of it. Takes care of all these things. We're always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord that the life of Jesus Christ might come forth. Because out of his glorious death brought forth his glorious life. And so when that glorious death works in us, that life is going to come forth. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. What a place we're in. You know, what a place God has brought us to. Now in Christ Jesus, you were far away. You're not far away no more. You've been made nigh by the blood, by the death. Been reconciled unto God through the cross. And one body brought reconciliation. See, that's in the land. You've been reconciled. In his death, that you might live. The reason you're reconciling his death is because, you know, like Paul said, there's no good thing in my flesh. So God reconciled you in his death and he took care of the bad things in our flesh that we would come forth in his life, that we would dwell and live in his life. So he took care. Uh, he's like a medicine to our bad things. The other night, Brother Roger was talking, and, and it's just, you know, I, I, I made this comment. It's like the precious ointment. You know, we gather together, and there's such a richness of the Lord, and it's like ointment. It's because he's like ointment. He's like a medicine that just rolls from the head, the head who is Christ, and covers the whole body, and he just anoints us with his ointment, with his medicine that heals our souls, that we have joy 
inside. We have joy that the whole earth doesn't know anything about because of the ointment of life. That's just flowing out. Man, oh man, we, we have such an ointment of life that's been given to us of God to heal us that we would bring forth that which is God through us. Well, I'll stop right here tonight. Somebody tried to chat with me and I just now saw it, so I apologize. Um, but anyway, I'm going to take you off mute.